80 Days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Werner's most famous work. I'm here in what's the very centre of London, Trafalgar Square. And this city is the capital of what was once the greatest empire the world had ever seen. It's played many roles through its history, but what really lies beneath the face of London? What is it like today in 2022, post Queen Elizabeth's passing? And how did that compare to 1872 when Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days was first published. I want to know. I want to get an idea of this special place through its streets, which are immersed in living culture and traditions. And I want, I want to understand why the locals here revere and adore living in this great metropolis of London. It's a wonderful world if you'll only take the time to go around it. Phileas Fogg is an extraordinary character, I think. He starts off in the Reform Club as a repressed Englishman of a certain class and certain type, eating the same food every day, seeing the same people every day. I have on deposit at Baring's Bank the sum of £20,000, and I'm willing to wager any or all of it upon the same contention, namely that I can complete a tour of the world in 80 days. One of the things that Ashley Ferro has introduced into the story is a history for Fogg where he chose not to go on an adventure once before because he was scared really and in that moment he also wrote off his his chance for romantic happiness so the, the, the things all sort of come together in Fogg now trying to conquer that. I'm here outside the Reform Club in Mayfair in London and in my new TV series 80 Days I'm attempting to follow in the footsteps of Phileas Fogg as he makes his famous journey around the world in 80 days. It may not take me 80 days, but I'm gonna do my best to follow in the footsteps and give an updated version on what it's like to do now. Gentlemen, I have on deposit at Baring's Bank the sum of 20,000 pounds, and I'm willing to wager any or all of it upon the same contention, namely that I can complete a tour of the world in 80 days. <laughs> Michael Tart, around the world in 80 days. He begins his journey with a slight naivety, I think, and, and very quickly he gets to Paris and there's revolution afoot and he all finds it too much and by sheer luck, really, he manages to get through the first bad moments and persist on his journey and bit by bit, very slowly, over the, the course of, of our story, we see him find himself, I suppose, and, and find his inner strength and find who he has the potential to be. So in this series, I'm going to endeavor 
to follow in the footsteps of Jules Verne's most famous character, the intrepid and distinguished gentleman, Phileas Fogg. Now, Jules Verne's famous book, Around the World in 80 Days, set the Victorian era alight. It was published in 1872, and the adventure novel had these grand dreams of circumnavigating the known world in less than three months. So I'm about to start my intrepid journey following the footsteps of Phileas Fogg. I'm in London at the moment, headed to Paris by rail. And on the way I've been thinking about Jules Verne, that modern father of science fiction, one of my favourite writers as a kid growing up. I loved his imagination and his ability to invent worlds kind of way before the modern filmmakers of today. You'll know his works such as Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Journey to the Centre of the Earth, and of course, Around the World in 80 Days. picture screen explodes with unprecedented power as the two masters of imagination, Jules Verne and Walt Disney, join to bring you a shattering new experience in entertainment. Read by countless millions, translated into 18 languages, this classic adventure is a story of measureless scope, fraught with fantastic beauty and danger. And as well as the book, Around the World in 80 Days, has been made into countless films, countless TV series. There's been animated versions, um, versions with David Niven, uh, probably the most classic one, as Phileas Fogg, the Pierce Brosnan, and various other actors have actually pl played Mr. Fogg. The 1956 film version won five Oscars, including Best Picture, and that's the one that starred David Niven and Cantiflas as Passepartout. Shirley MacLaine was in it, Robert Newton, and there was an all-star cast of cameo actors. The film was directed by Michael Anderson and produced by Michael Todd. The music score was composed by Victor Young, and the Todd AO 70mm cinematography was by Lionel Linden. And the seven minute long animated sequence that is shown at the end of the film it was incredible and it was created by one of my favourite you know, designers of all time, the, the legendary Saul Bass. And it still you know, looks as crisp and as current and as cool today as it did in 1956. Despite the years in film and advances in film know-how and all the remakes that came afterwards, to me, the 1956 version that won the Academy Award for Best Picture is still the benchmark. Although the Victorian era was a, a time of great social inequality. The boom of industrialization brought about many changes and affected every single class in society. It created new wealth through people who were in industry, merchants, making new classes, new structures and new ideas. Many new opportunities came as a result of new technologies, especially steam. Jules Verne's original story of Around the World in 80 Days romanticised the glory of the days of the British Empire when it was the Raj in India and there were manservants and butlers, when the United Kingdom was the world's reigning supreme global power. Now Verne's protagonist, Phileas Fogg, he attempts to win a bet by doing the seemingly impossible of travelling around the world in 80 days, enlisting these new forms of transportation from the steam age. It's kind of hard to reconcile that back at the height of the Industrial Revolution in the, in the Great British Empire, the highest form of technology 
is steam. The simple process of heating water and capturing the energy that the boiling water gave off was able to open up vast new possibilities, vast new economies in global travel, enterprise, trade and transportation. Strange when you compare today with the technology we have, with everything being online, the internet, social media apps. It's almost like these days, if you, you don't have an online presence, you don't have a, a robust business. There's one word that sums up, I guess, the United Kingdom over all the other mega cities of the world. It would have to be tradition history and the monarchy. I know when Jules Verne released his book in 1876, Queen Victoria was on the throne. On the throne and head of the mightiest empire the world has ever seen. It made the Roman Empire pale in comparison and every other empire since. And in 1872, the, the British Empire was at the height of the colonial, it was the height of its power. And the publication of Jules Verne's novel came out of a time when technological innovations were opening up new possibilities for rapid travel and global tourism. And it was the steam age. So where did Jules Verne get his story from? Well, of course, largely from his own imagination. He's known as the, one of the, the four founders of the entire science fiction genre and an unrivaled ability to conjure up these imagined worlds and to take his readers on wonderful adventures, all created by his endlessly imaginative, inventive mind. You know, voyage to the center of the earth, 20,000 leagues under the sea, you know, the legendary gentleman. Um, he, there were so many things he did and wrote. He was very prolific and amazing writer. Now Jules Verne loved the sea. He grew up in the, the busy port town of Nantes in France and from a young age he was transfixed by these giant sailing ships coming into port and setting sail for distant countries. Um, he was a keen sailor. He enjoyed long voyages on his own steam-powered yacht, complete with a ten-strong crew. And of course Verne lived in a time of momentous innovation Railroad routes were being laid across the world, especially across America and throughout India. The Suez Canal had just been opened to allow ships to circumnavigate the globe. And of course, the idea of circumnavigating the world was, was all of a sudden in the air. It was a brazen adventure. There was a roaring success on publication. Jules Verne's classic novel inspired many copycats of Phileas Fogg's famed cross-continent journey, both real and fictional which I guess I am adding my name to that list of scallywags.
11.59, Grimes. Yes, sir. You may serve Mr. Fogg. But he isn't here, sir. He will be in exactly one minute at noon. Today being Tuesday, he will take the white fish with Redding sauce. Yes, sir. And a rhubarb and gooseberry tart with just a morsel of Cheshire cheese. I'll see to it instantly, sir. Uh, Good day, Mr. Fogg, sir. The white fish is excellent this morning, sir. A little less of the sauce, Wilson. In 80 days. Oh, God, now, Fogg, you must be joking. We all know there are great improvements in the railways and the steamships, but uh, well, what about, um, what about shipwrecks and storms and railway disasters and so on and so forth. Included. Sir, or theoretically, I suppose it's possible, but on a practical basis, not a chance. 80 days. Wrong, sir. Impossible. 80. Very well. I would be willing, for my own part, to wager 10,000 pounds that such a journey cannot possibly be made in that time. Then you would lose, sir. The devil I would. If you think it's possible, I defy you to do it, sir. Are you suggesting, Mr. Stewart, that I should journey around the world in 80 days? I'm here outside the Reform Club in Mayfair in London and in my new TV series 80 Days I'm attempting to follow in the footsteps of Phileas Fogg as he makes his famous journey around the world in 80 days. Phileas Fogg left from here 116 years ago in October 1872. He set off with head high, clear eye, never hurried, always calm. But then of course he was fictional. I've actually got to do it. To go where he only went in Jules Verne's mind, across Europe into Egypt, through the Red Sea and round the Arabian Peninsula to India, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai and Japan. Then I must follow fog across the Pacific Ocean to California. From there, take a train across America to Halifax, Nova Scotia or New York. Then it's the Atlantic, Liverpool, London, and home. Now, the famous Reform Club is the second oldest gentlemen's club in all of Great Britain. It was founded in 1836 with the ferment of ideas, ideals, and political activity, which in part found expression in the Great Reform Act of 1832. And this is Victorian England. So what does the Reform Club have to do with around the world in 80 days? Well, pretty much everything, because that's where the story begins. Are you formally challenging me to undertake a journey around the world in 80 days? <laughs> I say this is absurd. Gentlemen, I have on deposit at Baring's Bank the sum of 20,000 pounds, and I'm willing to wager any or all of it upon the same contention, namely that I can complete a tour of the world in 80 days. 
I've never even been in one of these terrifyingly exclusive establishments, but everyone knows that in all the world, the most exclusive, the grandest, the mustiest, and dustiest are right here in the throbbing heart of Britain's swinging capital. A club is the sanctuary of the English gentleman, the place where he goes to get away from his wife. In fact, there's not a wife on this whole sceptered aisle who can get a foot through one of those massive doors, much less an American. And what's even worse, an actor. What to do? Even today, the world of the London Gentlemen's Club is wrapped in mystery. What are they? What goes on in there? Why are they so exclusive? Let's take a step into this elusive British subculture. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Clubland. The English Gentleman. In the Middle Ages, it was actually its own social class. A gentleman was the lowest rank of English noblemen. They were often sons of lesser nobles, such as esquires, knights and baronets. These lesser nobles were called gentry. They owned country estates and lived off rent paid by peasants. Above them came the greater nobles, the peerage. Barons, viscounts, earls, marquises, dukes and finally the royal family itself. Gentlemen were the last group that could still be considered nobility, a lowest common denominator title that applied to all English aristocracy. In the following centuries, gentlemen became a blanket term used to describe any member of the British elite. Basically, it's a right old mess. Toffs at the top, plebs at the bottom, and me in the middle making a fat pile of cash out of moon. Well, you better watch out, Mr Blackadder. Things are bound to change. Fast forward to London's West End in the 17th century. The aristocracy were living in a district called St James. A space was needed to socialise, unwind and have a drink, preferably away from the common folk in the local pubs and taverns. The first gentleman's club, White's, was established. White's remains the grandest and most prestigious gentleman's club in London. It's the model of the many gentlemen's clubs that followed. Now the club opened its doors to members in a house actually in 104 Pall Mall in Mayfair on the 24th of May. 1836 and pretty much planning for a new new premise started straight away because they knew that this was going to take off. So a new building um, was, was pitched out via a, a competition actually and Charles Berry was selected to create the new clubhouse. So Charles's design was inspired by the Italian Renaissance architecture that he was exposed to as a young student in Rome. And the front facade of the clubhouse borrows from Rome's famous Palazzo Farnese, which was completed in 1589 by none other than the unbelievably talented genius Michelangelo himself. Now, the Reform Club is one of the most prestigious private members clubs in London today, and it has a long and intriguing history. In 1981, the Reform was the first of the traditional men's clubs or gentlemen's clubs in London to admit women as members on equal terms. If you're looking for the Reform Club, it can be found on the south side of Pall Mall in Mayfair. And the club offers members, you know, all the, the benefits that um, the gentry would, would, would expect. Mr. Crosby's lunch. I presume you mean sir Michael Crosby's lunch. Presumably. If you follow me. Started without you. Hope you don't mind. I'll catch you. There's an extensive library, fine dining, an excellent wine cellar, there's a billiards room, a card room, and they have social events, music and theatre evenings, garden parties, a Christmas party, and discussion evenings are arranged for members and guests. Its membership has consisted of upper class men, and since obviously, as I said, 1981, women too, who were supposedly interested in progressive, scientific and political ideas, but who are still somewhat oddly resistant to change. It's two floors high with nine windows along the frontage and eight along the sides. 
a porter sits, or a guard, if you like, or a you know, gatekeeper, if you like, sits at the front desk in the lobby to answer visitors' questions and help keep out the riffraff, ensuring that none but its members penetrate within its sanctified halls. The interior hall is surrounded by colonnades supported by a large gallery. The floor is tessellated in imitation Roman mosaics. The pillars are made from stucco, the color of Siganese marble. The dome which lights the halls is of di diapered flint glass and is supported by 20 ionic columns. Their red porphyry basements breaking the line of a stone balustrade rest on a gallery which is reached by a broad white marble stairway. This gallery, where one can stroll in, has a cloistered, covered, a covered cloister and is fitted with easy chairs, mirrors, pictures, and a thick carpet. It is a kind of general sitting room, which from you can observe the hall below, into which visitors are ushered. A drawing room so large that it must have been intended for ballroom dancing, a card room, a reading room, private reception rooms, open into this gallery, as do two of the other important libraries one containing literary works, the other containing legal and political ones. And just a tip, if you plan to visit the Reform Club, hoping to get access and entry, wear a suit, <laughs> not denim, like I did. My new series, 80 Days, I'm going to attempt to follow in the footsteps of Phileas Fogg as he makes his journey 80 days around the world. A famous Jules Verne novel that was set in motion right here behind me at London's Reform Club. Phileas Fogg is said to be a typical gentleman of the Victorian period. This is absurd. Gentlemen, I have on deposit at Baring's Bank the sum of £20,000. And in order to be a true gentleman, you had to follow some rules and have some identifying characteristics. What were they? Yes, being entitled, being a snob, one might think. But in fact, there was a new kind of classification for chivalry. To be a gentleman implied a certain superior standard of moral conduct, an intellectual refinement which manifests itself in unrestrained yet delicate manners. A gentleman is to be cordial, intelligent, a master of the art of conversation, knows how the world around him revolves, has a basic understanding of science, mathematics, literature, and art. Being a gentleman also means treating others, especially women, respectfully. A list of laws and etiquette that any gentleman should obey was originally published in 1880 in a book called Hill's Manual of Social and Business Forms which when you read, which when I read line by line in the 2020s, it just sounds downright silly. Suffice to say, don't be a dick. But gentlemen back then was actually a formal rank of gentry. On a seemingly normal day at the exclusive reform club on Pall Mall in London, Phileas Fogg, a gentleman of great wealth and exacting tastes, makes an extraordinary £20,000 wager. He will perform a seemingly impossible feat and circumnavigate the globe in just 80 days. And I'm willing to wager any or all of it upon the same contention. 
namely that I can complete a tour of the world in 80 days. Accompanied only by his new French valet, the steady Passapatou, he sets off on a thrilling journey. ...that will burn into the stoke hole. Decks, masts, everything, including the lifeboats. Adventure, chaos and romance ensue as the daring pair harness the new power of steam to escape their ever-increasing enemies and beat the clock. It's kind of hard to reconcile that back at the height of the Industrial Revolution in the, in the Great British Empire, the highest form of technology was steam simple process of heating water and capturing the energy that the boiling water gave off was able to open up vast new possibilities, vast new economies in global travel, enterprise, trade and transportation. Strange when you compare today with the technology we have, with everything being online, the internet, social media apps. It's almost like these days, if you, you don't have an online presence, you don't have a, a robust business. Although the Victorian era was a, a time of great social inequality, the boom of industrialization brought about many changes and affected every single class in society. It created new wealth through people who were in industry, merchants, making new classes, new structures and new ideas. Many new opportunities came as a result of the new technologies, especially steam. Although the Victorian era was a period of extreme social inequality, industrialization brought about rapid changes in everyday life that affected all classes. Family life, epitomised by the young Queen Victoria, Prince Albert and their nine children, was enthusiastically idealised. But as the rich got richer on the spoils of the empire, the working classes suffered grinding poverty. The tremendous expansion of the middle classes, in both numbers and wealth, created a huge demand for goods and services. The pound was strong, labour was cheap. The Victorian era is widely regarded as a golden age of innovation and industry, when humanity made great leaps in technology and thinking. But what was life like for the ordinary Victorians, whose daily struggle for survival was far away from the sweeping progress and prosperity? Well, experts recount that it was pretty grim by all counts. Life expectancy at birth for the average Victorian was around 42, and more than 25% of children had died before their fifth birthday. Disease was rife. There were four major outbreaks of cholera alone between 1832 and 1866. And although in general, standard of living did improve over the period, but a third of the population was still living in abject poverty at the end of the 19th century. As I'm speeding through the English countryside on the way to Paris in the Eurostar, the trip to the railway station going through the heart of London had me thinking, had me thinking about the class system that, that was and is. I guess class today is very much um, all about economics and wealth. And going through the areas of Knightsbridge, Mayfair, Westminster, seeing all the designer boutiques that you have in every other major international city but there's a lot of people buying them there's a lot of luxury car retail outlets all through the place and it took me back to the big tip and it took me back to thinking about the Victorian era a time of 
Phileas Fogg and the Reform Club and, and I guess Oliver Twist. Um, that famous story about social inequity. It was also the time of child labour and exploitation. A series of factory acts from the 1830s onwards progressively limited the number of hours that women and children could be expected to work. Any attempts to organise labour, however, were banned by law until late in the century. Luxuries were not available to the means of working poor, who toiled for long hours in mills, mines, factories and docks. The dreadful working and living conditions of the early 19th century persisted in many areas until the end of the Victorian age, when the dark shadow of the workhouse loomed over the unemployed and destitute. 